Transylvanian Moonrise, a secret initiation in the mysterious land of the gods. Radu Sinemar and Peter Moon. Chapter 3, Makandi. Contrary to my expectations, I was quite calm and focused on preparing for my departure during the following two days. Although I intensely remembered many of the puzzling elements of my meeting with Eleanor and Ripa Sandi, I was not at all agitated but simply trying to analyze in depth what had been revealed to me. Just as it had been established, I phoned Eleanor the evening before we left to find out if the plans for our journey were still valid. After receiving his confirmation, I spent the few remaining hours prior to our meeting trying to sleep. I soon discovered this to be quite a difficult task. As soon as I closed my eyes, my mind was invaded by the image of an aesthetic mountain landscape where the cliffs and valleys were covered in ice and snow. Two peaks towered over the horizon, basking in the red ore and sunset. The overview was desolate and a cold wind blew strongly, ruffling the few lichens growing in a dried up riverbank. I tossed and turned in my bed without understanding the significance or message of that vision. Every time I closed my eyes and tried to fall asleep, it came back to me very clearly and with an amazing realism. Plus, when I was seeing the landscape, I perceived it with all of my senses so that I actually became very cold and used several blankets to cover myself. Eventually, after remaining on the border between wakefulness and sleep for a long time, I fell asleep but without dreaming. My absorption into the sleep state was so deep that when the alarm went off it took me a few good seconds to realize what was actually happening. The sound of the alarm was reaching me as if from very far away, gradually getting closer and closer. I finally awoke and noticed with amazement and great joy that I also felt excellent and very well rested. In high spirits, I took a cab to Eleanor's villa, but as a precautionary measure, I gave the driver an address a few streets away. When I arrived, Eleanor and Ripa Sundi were already there waiting for me. I thought I was late, but they assured me and told me everything was ready for our journey. Isn't the Yidam accompanying us? I asked in surprise, noticing that the deity was not in the house. Yes, but he will join us at some point on our way, the Lama answered without any other details. We got into Eleanor's car, a very luxurious jeep that was parked in front of the house. In order to be able to talk easily during the journey, the Lama proposed I stay with him in the back seats and I gladly accepted. It was almost five in the morning when we left. The clear starry sky was forecasting a beautiful day. Besides that, the beginning of this particular November was proving to be very warm with only rare and short rains. I observed that if we needed to do any mountaineering that we would probably have very good weather for it. In response, Ripa Sundi explained that our efforts were not going to be great and that the weather would not be of much importance. His answer confused me a bit, but I did not ask for clarifications. As Eleanor drove fast, it took us only two hours to reach the foothills of the southern Carpathians that we had to cross. I was enchanted as I admired the wonderful landscape that basked in the superb light of the sunrise. I noticed that to our right, not far away from the area we were passing through, was the secret location in the Busigi Mountains that I had visited more than a year before. That very special place will play an important role in the near future of Romania, the Lama said unexpectedly. The discovery was not at all by chance and the expedition led by Cesar was a first sign of the coming changes, not only regarding Romania but the entire planet. The causes that will lead to these transformations are so complex that they can't be comprehended or understood by a normal human mind. That is why the few who are acting to pave the way, so to speak, are often supported by angelic entities belonging to different hierarchical categories of manifestation. In the Oriental tradition, these are called deities. It is good to know that they are organized in a pyramidal hierarchy that pretty much follows the same principles and structure as a company or industrial enterprise in modern society. Cesar spoke only vaguely about the help some angelic entities unconditionally offer to humanity, I said. I never understood though how this help is manifested or how it can be perceived here in the physical plane. 
Subtle purification is an important aspect of what these beings belonging to superior astral worlds are doing at the level of one country or even at the level of the entire planet, the Lama said. I hope that you are at least partly familiarized with this. In essence, it refers to some subtle realities that modern science rejects or at least ignores. Just as the human being has a bioenergetic aura so does the Earth. Due to the subtle bioenergetic field emanated by its biosphere, it has an aura of its own. Of course, unlike the aura of a human, the aura of the planet is gigantic. The characteristics of the two auras, however, are just the same as the energetic processes happening within them are identical in principle. For example, a man's aura can gradually become impure due to his unhealthy diet and the impure and gross environment he lives in, but it is at its most acute and profound following the actions a man does, especially mental acts or thoughts. In regards to the Earth's aura, its condition depends on the nature of the physical, mental and verbal actions of the beings living on the planet's surface. For me, it was starting to be easy to conceive and assimilate this information, but I was not too sure it could be stomached by regular people. Unfortunately, these things are exactly as you said for such people, Ripa Sundi admitted. A man that is not aware of or even informed of his own subtle aura cannot believe that the planet he's living on is itself a being with a gigantic aura. For an experienced clairvoyant, however, this is only too obvious. They have free and unlimited access to the astral plane and can, in certain circumstances, perceive the actual aura of the planet which is very charged. I know that the aura of a being can give much information about their physical and psychic state, but is this also valid in regards to the destiny of that respective being? I asked. I mean, does our aura contain information about our karma? The energetic structure of the aura is very complex, he responded, but an essential part of it is that within it is encoded practically any information about that man that is more or less hidden in specific ways. Hence, the correct reading of the aura can foresee the nature of a future disease, its seriousness, or even the death of that respective being if certain particular signs are seen. Usually, these symptoms are the result of some karmic mistakes made in previous lives that were transmitted into the present life and have even been unconsciously accentuated by that person. Such karmic influences of a subtle energetic nature appear in the aura as dark vortexes and are almost black in very serious cases. From the exterior to the interior, they look like a deep funnel towards the body outline. In a way, they can be likened in form and structure with a boil. Their presence in the aura is most often a sign of destiny for that person's life. It's very similar for the Earth's aura. The most harmful elements that contributed to it becoming impure are men's vices and misdeeds to which you can add wrongly orientated technology. The situation is becoming acute because of the great number of human beings living on the surface of the planet who act wrongly and tip the balance to the negative side. After a short break, during which I intensely analyzed the information I had just heard, the Lama felt the need to give me further explanations. The aura is, in fact, a subtle energetic cumulus and depends upon the predominant nature of the energies that comprise it. Things here are relatively simple, if you act only beneficially then you accumulate positive energies of a beneficial nature in your aura. Such an aura is bright, alive, active and radiant. But for those who fall prey to vices and persevere in perverse and negative thinking, their aura is gradually becoming more and more impure with maleficent energies. These make it dull, tarnished, and dominated by dark colors like muddy green, brown, dark red and even areas of dark gray and black. These particularities of the aura are intimately correlated with destiny's traits. The interaction between human beings or between them and the things or phenomena surrounding them is firstly an energetic interaction at the subtle level of the aura. This is by virtue of the known principle that birds of a feather flock together, and this principle is valid everywhere throughout the creation. That is why a human being that is evil and even satanic in his behavior will never be capable of doing good deeds. For the same reason. You will almost never see a gang of villains going to church and enjoying the company of priests and saints in order to repent and transform their lives. 
those unfortunate beings will continue to act by virtue of the predominantly negative energetic vibrations that they have in their aura and will associate with people of the same nature, outdoing one another in new misdoings. As I have already told you, they thus sow the seeds of a bitter destiny that they will have to live with the same intensity of loss and suffering that they caused others. I've met people who mockingly say that they will have enough time afterwards to pay for the mistakes done at the present, I said. Personally, I think this is a very detrimental vision of reality. It is true that in their unawareness and ignorance, many people let themselves be tempted by their mind's voice and not their hearts, responded the Lama. For example, some are tempted to take advantage of life's pleasures, as much as possible, and in a selfish way, not make allowance for the bad seeds they then sow, these people think they are going to have enough time later in life to consume these negative effects or, in other words, pay them off. I have to tell you though that this is the sign of great stupidity. It is similar to saying that you want to enter the despicable mud found in a pond just so you can then get out and wash it off. Of course, this is possible but it will involve more effort and you will need more time to clean the mud you're covered in. What then is the use of such action? The merits you accumulated with difficulty at some point in your life will be quickly annihilated by bad actions that bring a so-called satisfaction that is only partial and ephemeral. I was starting to realize that such a somber perspective was similar to the toil of Sisyphus, and the only explanation I could find in such cases was the weakness of people when facing the ephemeral temptations of the material world. I understood that negative emotions generate quite rapidly in the human being as inferior and gross preoccupations which include the avid tendency to gain, opulent luxury, fame and the fight for power. All of these have a tendency to generate feelings of greed, insensitivity, meanness, envy, selfishness, fury, or revenge. I then asked Ripa Sundi to what extent all of these negative emotions affect the human aura. These emotions are, in fact, subtle energies with a gross frequency of vibration. If they are not quickly removed or given up fast in order to be replaced with their exact opposite, they will set in at the level of the aura and various corresponding body organs which will cause psychic disturbances, serious diseases, and illnesses. In a similar way, this process happens in the Earth's aura which is deeply influenced by the aura of the human beings that live on it. Unfortunately, the present situation of the planet's aura is quite critical. As it stands now, it can be likened to the aura of a gravely sick person. In such a situation, it is natural to follow a purification treatment in order to cure the disease. Just as in a human being, the planet will be convulsing or undergo other similar phenomena that people living on its surface will perceive as apocalyptic events. There's nothing supernatural about this. It is just a counterbalancing effect of the negative charge. In other words, the planet's negative karma has reached a critical point and is thus influencing the destiny of humankind. I have also spoken with Eleanor about some aspects that are related to destiny, and I think I understand its formative mechanism, I then told Ripa Sandi. Yes, he said. In principle, the process is quite simple. Every human being is characterized by a specific energy that determines a certain general mental and soul state. This general state will then create channels through which some dominant mental tendencies will manifest in correlation with the feelings and energy of that human. Then, the dominating tendencies will generate an entire series of other habits and tendencies that structure most of that person's future destiny. This is how you explain why some people with a gross energy manifest gross feelings and ideas. They are not satisfied with their opinions and start judging others after their own meanness, skepticism and perversity. All these happen because they cannot conceive that others could be different from themselves. In such circumstances, the evolutionary path of such beings will be long and difficult as they have not yet awakened the beneficial force of their subtle structure and this is exactly why they do not have what it takes to support a balanced and harmonious life. You can thus understand why certain spiritual leaps do not happen overnight. In the case of beings who are only starting to awaken spiritually, the energetic cumuli one has is not great enough. That is to say, it is not predominant. In such circumstances, 
the feelings and states that being is faced with will be mixed, meaning some will be good but most of it will be bad. Due to several factors, both internal and external, this will generate a continuous fluctuation of the being between opposite poles. For example, if maleficent accumulations are present in the nature of that being when he comes into contact with a maleficent ambience, he will be affected and will relive states that he abhors. A being who has accumulated beneficial energy par excellence will not have any maleficent reaction if in the same negative ambience. The one who has even a little maleficent cumulus in his aura will feel, in a reduced way, that environment. In other words, he will still notice that the respective ambience is bad. By the opposite, a totally beneficial being, even when coming into contact with that inferior environment, will not perceive it as such. He will, of course, be aware of its nature due to the reactions of those who are found there. Nevertheless, he will remain completely unaffected because there are no connections in his aura to those negative energetic manifestations. This is a very important aspect and this is why I want you to understand it well, Ripa Sundi added in an emphatic voice.